I'm just, oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Artist Loft uh, class. Uh, this is part two of Urban Sketching Using Limited Perspective. Last week we had part one. And if you missed that class, uh, that it is on YouTube. If you just search Artist Loft Urban Sketching Limited Perspective, and our moderator can drop the uh, link to that one in the, the chat right now. Um, and if you were looking for more classes on uh, perspective drawing using linear perspective, not limited like we're, we're doing in these classes, uh, we've done a number of classes in this series that related to linear perspective. And uh, the moderator can drop the links to those in the chat as well. Or if you just search Artist Loft and Perspective Drawing on YouTube, you should be able to find those if you're watching this later on YouTube and don't have access to our chat. Um, we noticed that the supply list for tonight's class was also not listed uh, for the class tonight for some reason. And the uh, images that were provided were possibly not there as well. But if you attended last week, you should already have all of that. But if not, we can drop that information in the, the chat for you now and I'll go over supplies if you're watching this later on YouTube so that you can be sure to have all of the same supplies that I'm using. So I'm gonna uh, switch to my tabletop view. But actually, before I do that, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the class that's coming up because um, I believe we do not have a class next week um, because it's the Wednesday uh, before the holiday, but um, the following Wednesday is going to be part one in a three-part premium class. And pardon me for one moment, I'm gonna grab the example for that class so that you can see what to expect uh, for that one. Okay, it doesn't appear to be right there on in front, but you can see the uh, the class that is coming up, the premium class, if you click on the upcoming classes on the, the Michaels website. Um, it is a three-part premium class on uh, figure drawing, well, on drawing uh, a face in using pen and ink. And it's a very detailed drawing of the model that we have been focusing on that I gathered images for for this and series of figure drawing classes that we've been doing lately. So um, check that out. You don't want to miss it. And uh, before the class is over tonight, I'll I'll try to grab that example to show you. I thought I had it right on top on on the side of my desk. And it's funny we had so much time before class started, and I didn't even think of it. But um, yeah, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of that exciting premium class since it is a three-part class you want to make sure that you sign up for all three parts of it um and we're going to really take our time and have a, a gorgeous product uh by the the end of of that three-part class and with the premium classes the uh YouTube link to the recording is only sent to participants of the class who registered beforehand. So wanted to make sure that I talked about that. Uh, go ahead and switch to my tabletop view and go over supplies. So we are using the Artist Loft watercolor paper, the seven by 10 watercolor paper. We're using the 48 piece set of the watercolor markers, which are a lot of fun. The Artist Loft illustration pens. We have three of those, the 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3. The other one seems to have disappeared to the other side of my desk. Oh, here it is with my paintbrushes. And then we've got the Artist Loft watercolor brushes, the synthetic watercolor brushes. 
We haven't really used our sketching pencils too much, but you might want to have some artist soft sketching pencils on hand and an eraser if you're drawing in pencil first and then adding the ink and watercolor markers and then a jelly roll gel pen, white gel pen. And I believe that is it. If I missed any supply on the supply list, uh, please let me know. And then also, this is not an artist loft supply, but you're gonna want paper towels and water cup. And the idea behind these classes is that you could take everything that we are doing in these classes and you could have a mobile studio on the go and you could go outside and do some urban sketching on the scene. So the watercolor markers make it a little easier. Although if you have a travel set of watercolor paints, then that's wonderful as well. But the watercolor markers make it a little easier to travel with these supplies. All you need is a water bottle and maybe a cup to uh, mix your, put your paint brushes in. But other than that, everything is, could easily fit into your, your bag backpack, purse, and you could go find a lovely park bench with a distant view of a skyline like this that has limited perspective and do this outdoors. Or you can gather sketches like we did in the urban sketching class using limited perspective from a couple weeks back, which was the unofficial first part of this little series here where we talked about just gathering thumbnail sketches. And you could do that on watercolor paper and then those could be taken back inside and then you could add color to them at your leisure. So don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes and follow or tag me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art and also on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art. Oh, and I forgot. Actually, the next premium class, there is one next week. I totally misspoke, y'all. On the 21st next week is the premium class on sketching clouds. I don't know why I was thinking we had uh, a week off, but the week after that is going to be that other premium class. Just wanted to make sure I'm mentioning those premium classes since next week we'll be in one and I won't get a chance to mention them. Okay, so in last week's class, we did a very identical sketch to this one from the example from the class. Uh, we started out with a very loose, empty sketch of these buildings using just stacking rectangular shapes on top of each other, keeping in mind what was in the foreground, middle ground, and background. And we kept everything really loose and sketchy. We added these hatching lines, and then we used the watercolor markers to create a gradient. And we pulled that blue color down using water and our paintbrushes. And I just love how these watercolor markers behave when you add a uh, water to them. They're really fun and they, they bleed together in a very exciting way. And then after that, we started on this sketch, which I will get back to in just a moment, of these power lines in the, one of the images that I provided for you. And we went very slowly together to build up this seemingly simple silhouette of a tree line and some power lines, but it's definitely more complicated than it seems. So we'll continue with that one in just a minute. But first, I wanted to talk about this because in last week's class, I mentioned that when this happens, it can, can be fixed, but you want to wait until things are dry. So just like with any watercolors, with these watercolor markers, you want to paint in layers. So you want to do your first layer and then while that layer is drying, work on somewhere, something else or work on a different part of the drawing. Because if you continue to add onto something while it's super wet like this, then it can quickly 
um, make the paper buckle and just make uh, you know the paper get kind of yucky and you'll lose a lot of quality in what's naturally happening in that first layer like all of this beautiful little striations that happen as we dragged the watercolor marker pigment down with the water, you would lose that if you kept brushing into that. So you wanna let all that lovely natural stuff that happens, you wanna let that dry and then go back and make any adjustments. So this layer of color kind of dried a little too fast. I was talking when I put these layers on there. And that reminded me that when you're blending two colors together, you really want to quickly get the watercolor or the, excuse me, the water on your paintbrush. You want to get it on there quickly. So that blue color that I put on second dragged down, but this darker blue sort of dried at the top of the page. So if, and then there, there was someone, one of our, our regulars, Arthur, who comes to the classes all the time. He had a lovely example that he held up at the end of the class where it looked like he didn't add a lot of water to the, the layers. And it does definitely look nice to just use these watercolor markers by themselves without water. So that's always an option. But if something like this happens and you don't like it and you want to disguise this separation between a dry layer and a wet layer is basically we're just going to wait for it to dry and then we're going to put on another layer, but we want to be really careful to maybe not upset or cover up anything like I really like this area right here, so I hesitate to put too much more on here because I don't want to lose this whole moment is really nice for me. So I really just want to disguise this separation and maybe you've got a similar area in your drawing. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to try not to talk too much while I do it. I'm just going to do it really quickly is I'm going to go right up to the edge and I'm just going to try to create a little vignette of darker color that does blend and bleed together right here. And I might lose some of the quality that's happening there that I did like as I'm doing this, but I'm just going to accept that that might happen. So let me get this darker color on and I'm using just a horizontal hatching line motion as I do that. And maybe I'll really lay it on there kind of thick right here. And then I'm going to take one of my flat paintbrushes and my water and start to bleed that, but I'm going to let it pool up a little bit right here. And maybe I can kind of make it feel like a little cloud layer above this lighter area in the sky. I'm kind of moving my paintbrush around in some circles, letting it pool together in an interesting way. And it's starting, I'm just really focusing on that area where the, the separation of lines were happening. So I can camouflage that moment. And it might look a little unrealistic. It might look a little bit more like an illustration here, but that was kind of the effect that I've been going for with all of these. So again, if you're looking for hyper-realism, that's not really what we're focusing on in these classes. So in what world would the clouds create this perfect kind of theater drape? I am so sorry that happened last week where I, I have my phone and do not disturb, but there are two people who still get to text me when my phone's in do not disturb. And I have to remind them that this is the time when I'm teaching my Michaels class. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. It's, it's kind of created a bit of a puddle. I've got some fun little splatter marks that happened over here to the side and yeah, I've created this 
something that feels like theater drapes a little bit. And I'm just gonna really kind of force it to pull up where I want to disguise those marks. And I won't really know exactly how that's going to look until it dries. But I feel like that's good enough. It's getting, honestly, it's just getting too wet to mess with it too much more. So I'm going to wait. And then if I still have not done it, then I'll do that again when it's dry. So the idea is just do what you want to do until it gets too wet and then wait for it to dry. Everything watercolor related, be it gouache, watercolor, ink, uh, they all behave very similarly and they uh, look different when they're, they're dry versus when they're wet. So although boy, that puddle is just so thick right there. That's going to take so long to dry. I'm going to go ahead and grab my paper towel, even though I know when I do this, I'm going to be able to see through it. But I'm going to go ahead and pull some of that out with the paper towel, just because it's really starting to buckle right there. So I'll probably have to do it a couple more times, but eventually it will disguise those dry marks. I believe in myself. It's just going to take a, another layer, maybe, maybe even a darker color next time. Okay, so moving on, we're going to get back to this, this one with the power lines. And then I asked if anybody had any requests for some of these other images, because I think uh, we will probably have time to do one more example after this one, especially if I make it small. So if there was one of those other reference images that I included that you wanted me to uh, cover. And then definitely make sure you sign up for, I know I misspoke at the beginning of the class, uh, make sure you sign up for that premium class on sketching clouds that is next week in pen and ink. That will really help elevate these, these urban sketches. I'm going to give away a bit of my cloud drawing secrets, which if you've checked out my work on Instagram, you know I'm a pretty prolific cloud painter and drawer. Okay, so we're going to put this sunset in here in just a minute. Actually, we're going to do the sunset first. So we're going to do the sunset set action first and we'll put a couple of these clouds in there and then after that we're going to do the power lines and the reason we're not going or the power lines are going to just be there they're in pen they're not going to uh but we're going to fill in the the silhouette and fill in the the dark lines of the little boxes on the power lines so, and the reason we're going to do that last is because I want to use the watercolor markers to do it in black and kind of bleed into those. And if we do that first, then we might accidentally upset that layer when we do the background. So you always want to start from your background and work your way forward to the foreground because that's going to make it easier to fill in any little keyhole spaces. Okay, so in my image here, I've got a very gray sky, so I'm using gray. I'm going to use a little bit of this lavender purple color, and then I'm going to use these very peachy colors for the, the glowy part of the sky. And I might have a tiny bit of yellow and orange in there, but mostly I'm going to use those peachy colors. Let me go ahead and grab a yellow, but I don't think I'll need much of it. And I love all the colors that come in this 48 
piece set, I think there's a lot of really interesting hues and tones happening in here that, but it's fun to still layer them and use a few different colors in any one area. And if you're working with watercolor paint, I suggest that you mix some colors together and see what sort of interesting colors you can get when you combine a few things, like rather than just using blue, take uh, two or three blues that you have and combine those. Rather than just using one of these peachy colors, why not use three and, or four analogous colors uh, to that peachy color and just make your colors that much more dynamic, right? But the issue is that we gotta work kind of fast if we wanna bleed them together. So I'm just kind of front ending all the explanation so that I can work really quickly once I, I get things going. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the farthest away, which is the top part of the sky. Uh, technically is farther away, like clouds will always, in this image, the clouds that are bigger are, um, oh my gosh, I'm, that's, that's wrong. What I just said is wrong. Ignore what I just said. So the top of the sky is actually, the clouds at the top of the sky are closer to you, but it still feels the farthest away as far as our picture plane goes. So we're gonna work from the top down. Okay, but yeah, clouds that are closer to you are usually at the top of the sky and clouds that are far away are gonna be closer to the horizon and appear smaller. Okay, so I'm gonna use my gray. I'm just gonna... Get a nice quick layer of gray on there and just confidently putting that gray on. And I'd say we'll go about a third of the way down with that gray. And then we're gonna add some lavender purple in there to make it more interesting. And then we're gonna quick grab our paintbrushes and pull that down before it dries. So I'm gonna grab my big flat brush and use a nice horizontal brush stroke. And yeah, it's better to just work quickly with these watercolor markers and get some colors to bleed together. And if you don't like it or you wanna add something else, wait for that layer to dry and then go back in and add it because if you hem and haw about it like I did the other day talking, then you just end up with those streaks. There's also nothing wrong with embracing those streaks and putting it on nice and dry with some, some hatching marks as well. Okay, so yeah, I love how that gray and lavender are bleeding together as they come down. And this is maybe not exactly like the colors that I'm seeing in the, the image but it's definitely interesting. And there's no rule that says I can't make the sky colors more interesting to me. Okay, so now I'm gonna go against what I just said about working from the top down because I don't wanna bleed things to, um, we're gonna kind of let these meet in the middle. So I'm gonna put this yellow on really quick, right down here at the edge. And I'm using the thinner part of the brush tip here. Kind of like the juxtaposition of this dry business next to the, the wet, bleedy sky. Might be kind of nice to just leave that alone or I guess if you put it on in a way that you really like how it looks dry, then it really doesn't matter if it stays that way. Oh yeah, this peach color really pulls those, that orange and that yellow together beautifully. I guess that's 
more of like a skin tone, the Caucasian skin tone there. And then here's the kind of peachy pink color. Okay, and then I think that's enough of it that I can make it bleed over to the other side of the sky. So hurry up and get some water on there. And so I'm really just like pushing it around. Like I'm getting it super wet and then just moving it around on the page and letting it bleed together. And if you really liked how it looked dry, then you can let it, let this wet layer dry and then go back in and add some dry layer back on top. But you see what I mean about why it's good to leave the foreground empty right now, because then I can just paint right over all of these boxes. The illustration pens are permanent ink though, so even if I had already filled those in, it wouldn't have bothered it too much, but I think it's nice to just wait and do that at the end when everything's dry. Okay, that's really fun. So now I yeah, need to wait until um, that's dry before I go in and fill in the boxes themselves, but I can go ahead and do the tree line. I'm just going to use the black watercolor marker. And if you wanted to use like the army green here, or if you wanted to painstakingly fill this in with your illustration pens, you could always do that too. I'm using a little scribble action here. And it might be bleeding a tiny bit into the, the yellow where I'm accidentally touching it a little bit. And if that's happening for you, that's totally fine. But if we had done this first, it might have bled more than we wanted it to. So it's good to save things in your foreground for last. Right, and since I'm almost done with this example, were there any requests for which one of these other images that uh, somebody wanted me to focus on next? I'm using a, a round brush now to fill this in. If not, I'm just gonna pick one of these other examples in. Oh dear. Despite my best efforts, it still bled into there a little bit. I kind of like the way it looks when it accidentally bleeds though, so I probably would just let it do its thing, but and actually when it bleeds, it kind of does that little, gives you those little veins and sometimes that can even feel like the edge of a tree line. So that might end up being a nice organic mistake that happens.
Okay, so that was our power line example. I'm going to set that off to the side and we'll come back to it when that's dry in a bit and add fill in the last of those little power line boxes. Okay, how about I do this one where the sun is in the sky? That feels like a crowd pleaser. I'm gonna take a clean sheet of my watercolor paper and I'm gonna take my 0.1 nib illustration pen. And I'm not going to do anything to the sky. And I'm just going to look at my silhouette of buildings here in this image. And if you're looking at the digital version, you can probably see a little more detail in this image. But in this printout, I can't see much. It's very blurred together. So I'm just going to get the overall. skyline to happen here. Again, just focusing on the main shapes that are jumping out at me. And I'm hovering over the page so that I don't commit to every mark that my pen might want to make. I kind of hover so that I can get this sketchy implied line thing to happen. And I'm letting my lines be kind of wobbly. I'm embracing imperfection. We're using the same sort of idea that we used in the urban sketching limited perspective class where we were just sketching using pen and ink two weeks ago to add these little boxes for the windows. And I'm not worried about them being perfect. Because when you step back and look at it from far away, that creates a pretty nice little effect here. And then for the side of the building, you can, there's a tiny bit of linear perspective happening right here in that this, this side of the building is the horizontal lines are traveling towards the horizon. So there's this imaginary point on the horizon called a vanishing point where these lines become orthogonal lines and they appear to slant down in the direction towards that vanishing point, but they don't actually do that. It's an optical illusion, and you can check out those classes on linear perspective if all of that was Greek to you. But instead of having all of those windows pointing down in linear perspective, I'm just going to kind of do a little side angle thing like that. And if yours looks super wonky, you could just keep going over it with more hatching lines and just make it one big shadowy blobby area or you could do something like this and just make it another building <laughs> that sticks straight up right so if your linear perspective skills are 
just not there, then feel free to just make everything a straight up and down rectangle, right? And don't even worry about any moments like that that might be tricky for you, because that's what this class was all about, was finding ways around our linear perspective skills to still be able to enjoy urban sketching and have a product that is satisfying. So I'm just using those cross hatching, hatching line methods. And since that's like kind of distracting me a little bit now, being so dark, I'm going to use my thicker nib and my 0.5 to basically do exactly what I just did, but and then make it a little darker. So if there's any moments like that in your drawing where you're like, oh dear, I tried to go ahead and put the orthogonal lines in and it didn't work out, then you can just do some hatching and cross hatching over it and make it a forward facing building in full silhouette. And we'll do that on a few of these others too, so that it doesn't feel too stark over there on its own. And we'll go ahead and fill in these windows. I do want to revisit linear perspective in more, uh, like just revisit it because I we did that class, the mixed media class with a, a house, but I think that was a while back and we could definitely stand to do it again. And I was gathering some images in downtown Austin the other day, standing at the corner of a building. And I got some one point perspective images looking down the center of an alley of the same building. And then I faced the corner and got some two point perspective images. And then I pointed my camera up and got a three point perspective image, all of the same building. So I thought that would be really helpful if you struggle to understand linear perspective. So I will plan that those, that series of classes for 2023 should these classes continue, which I hope they do. Um, but you can check out those links that we dropped in the chat or search on YouTube for the, the classes from last year. We definitely covered all of the basics of one, two, and three point perspective. We also talked about atmospheric perspective quite a bit. And then there was the class on landscape studies that revisited that. All of those links that the moderator already shared with you, you can refer back to any of those. Okay, so this skyline is definitely busier than one of the other skylines that we looked at. And a vertical hatching line is a great way to just quickly fill in a silhouette here. You could always do what we did with that tree line in the, the power line example as well. And just make it one big blobby silhouette, but I think taking the time to add some detail is good as well. Are there any questions jumping out about anything that we might want to talk about as we get closer to the end of the class here? No questions so far. Um, so Sarah said that she's doing um, this building perspective along with you. Okay, great. I'm just adding some of the other buildings that I see in the foreground here. I can get a little depth. Maybe on these I use a lighter. If they're showing up lighter in the photograph. Kind of 
kind of treat them the way we did in that other example so that it creates a little depth. Remember when we add our washes to these, like even though these might feel a little unfinished, when we go back and add the wash layers to them, it's kind of nice to leave it a little open-ended like this so that the color can fill in the gaps for you. So and you can always go back and, and add more details with your, your color later as well. Okay, so let's talk about the sky. So we're not gonna do anything with a pencil or a pen to the sky. We're gonna just let our, our watercolor markers do all the work here. Um, so basically we're gonna have the sun here in the, in the, not in the corner, but where the, we were talking about the rule of thirds, it would be where the lines intersect at the point of thirds right here. So where our line, our vertical lines of thirds and our horizontal lines of thirds would intersect, that's where it's going on the image there. So I always try to think about the rule of thirds when I'm uh, taking photographs. Okay, so as we add our color, we're going to radiate out from a blank spot in the middle. And if you had any masking tape nearby, you might even, uh, there's a little trick you can do to keep yourself from putting um, water or, or color right there. We can just build up and create a little circle out of masking tape. So I can put some masking tape right there and then just tear little bits of pieces off of my masking tape until it feels circular. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle because you're probably not gonna really notice because the layer that we're gonna put right next to it is gonna be so light as well. So if you can't get your tape to form a perfect circle, it's not a huge deal. We just want it to be slightly circular. And I realized masking tape was not on the supply list, but I just had it nearby. Okay, so that's our little makeshift masking fluid. All right, and then we're going to take our gray and some blues. We want at least two or three blues here just to make it interesting. Okay, and so we're going to create a gradient and I'm going to talk about it first, then I'm going to do it really fast, just like with the other ones. I'm not going to worry about the clouds in here, so make sure you come to that premium class on sketching clouds and pen and ink. I will give you some really fascinating tricks and tips for drawing clouds that can be applied to painting as well. Okay, so over here, we're just going to make kind of a radiating, uh, we're going to do the gray in a way that radiates around this blank circle, and then we're going to bleed it. We're going to push the water around until we get around the edge of where we're going to leave it blank paper, and then we'll let that dry, and then we'll peel off our paper, and we should have what feels like the sun. And then over here, we're going to just pull down a horizontal gradient of some some blues. So our blues are going to be dragged down horizontally and right here where these transitional moments meet is where we're going to have to work quickly to make the colors bleed together. So I've got three blues and my gray. Okay, so I'm going to get my gray on there. And I'm still going to keep my, 
keep wanting to say brush strokes because it's a brush tip pen. So it, it is like brush strokes since we're kind of making, doing half drawing, half painting here. So I'm just kind of radiating around that circle with the, the gray and kind of pull it over here to the right just a tiny bit as well. And this is going to feel cloud like, even though we're going to mostly ignore the clouds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get that wet because I'm afraid if I don't, it's going to be dry and scratchy. So I got my flat brush. And again, if this doesn't work out exactly the way we want it to, then we let this layer dry and then do another layer. Gray kind of has a, a bit of a purple feeling to it when it gets wet, I've noticed. Okay, so I've got it right where I want it now. I keep radiating, radiating. And the closer I get to the circle, it's getting lighter because the water is thinning it out. And if it's not as transparent as you want it around the, the taped off area, then we can grab our paper towel and just radiate around it and pull it out. But I feel like that's pretty good. Okay. I think I was expecting it to look a little more dramatic than that. It looks pretty good though, y'all. All right, and then we'll get our blues on here real quick. And it's okay if these markers, you know, like the tip of them get wet as you do this. I hesitated to do this all at once because I didn't want to risk it staying too dry. Ooh, it's starting to bleed into that in a really nice way. Get some of these other blues in there too. Maybe just two. Two blues is enough. I'm afraid of it drying too fast again. Wow, it seems like it's that same color blue that just keeps not bleeding. Maybe it's that particular marker. Maybe it's not me. Okay, I thought maybe the last time I worked too slow, but I went pretty fast that time and it still gave me some streaks. Oh, well, we know how to camouflage it, so we can always Go back and fix that in another layer later if that's happening to you again. So then I'm just letting those two, like the grays and the blues, mix together a tiny bit here, but I'm just leaving the area around the sun nice and thin and transparent. And I'm looking at the clock. We got 10 minutes until the end of the hour. I guess it's going to be dry enough to peel that off. I'll probably peel it off before the, the end of the hour because I'm impatient to see what how it looks. Okay, so that same thing happened again. That particular color blue, which makes me think that particular color is not my friend. 
Um, let's see how that other one looked since it dried. So I think the solve is to just use an even darker color, like a color that's going to really cover it up. I went with like the same, the same sort of color again, or a similar color blue. I bet if I used, you know, my really darker blue or maybe purple, that it would be easy to to camouflage and cover that up. But I mean, it doesn't look terrible. I'm not mad about it. We could easily turn those into clouds as well. Okay, let's see how this looks if I go ahead and take the tape off. Even though I would advise letting it dry completely so you don't accidentally rip your paper if it's super wet. Okay, I like it. And then the way you can camouflage that little moment and make it like really bleed in as we can, or blend in, is we can use our white gel pen there at the edge. And just kind of scribble around and get a nice, more perfect circle to happen. But ideally, you want to wait for all of it to dry. I'm really trying to force it while it's still wet. So, but when that's dry, just go in with the gel pen and just keep circling around right there. Or if you have some white um, gouache or some white watercolor, um, some watercolor package like the Artist Soft watercolor uh, sets do come with a white watercolor. Okay, so that looks pretty fun. And then for the buildings, we're just going to do a similar thing as in that other example. I really love how the gray looks on the buildings. And the gray definitely doesn't do that thing where it stays dry. I think it must just be that particular blue marker in the set. Oh, the gray looks combined with a brown. And most of these buildings are either brown or gray. And then we'll just bleed those together. I'm just letting my brush strokes imitate the directional flow of the buildings. So if it was more vertical, I'm using vertical brush strokes. If it was more horizontal, using the horizontal brush strokes. And I really like how the gray and the brown look when they bleed together. All right, let's see if this is dry enough yet for me to use my gel pen on it yet. Okay, yeah, that's looking pretty good. I've got a bit of a glare on it from the my lights on the screen, it looks like, but yeah, I know if y'all have been following me a long time, 
in these classes with the graphite, I'm always like against rubbing it with your finger but with the white gel pen. I do sometimes touch it a little bit with my finger to make it, it blend a little bit more. And I think that's looking pretty good. All right. I'm just gonna take my white gel pen to this, this area too and see if I can play around with it and make myself happy. So I'm just gonna kind of outline that area where that separation is happening and like scribble into it a little bit with the gel pen and then rub it with my finger, even though I'm putting my oils from my hands on my artwork, y'all, when I do that, that's why I don't like it, but it does create an interesting effect and it blends with the gel pen a little bit. So that's fun. You can also maybe put some stars to help camouflage it. We can put some little clouds. I'm just scribbling in some little moments. That's another way to camouflage any streaks you're not super happy with. Okay. Well, I would love to see. Oh, wait, we didn't do our little power line boxes real quick. Let me grab my, and then I want to see what you guys accomplished with me today. Let me grab my point three nib real quick here, and I'm just going to fill them in. A nice hatching line that fills it in really solid. Oh, if I do that, we're going to go over time. But the last thing I wanted to say was you can also take your pen and how we started with that really great little edge to the tree line. You can go back in and add that back in. And then any little bleedy moments that happened, that can become the new edge of the tree line. So you can kind of do a little broken implied line thing right here. And then it just gives it like a really interesting makes it a little more a little more area of interest right there draws the eye around and you can fill in any gaps too between the sky and the trees with your black illustration pen okay i'd love to see any examples in the the crowd do we want to hold up your work and can spotlight you. Very nice, Sarah. Yeah, I love how your sky uh, gradation worked out. That's really nice. Let's see, Arthur. Oh, I like how you did that sun. Oh, yes, the silhouetted one's really strong. Let me see this, the one with the sun again. Oh, I wanted to see how Arthur did it dry. Oh, well, that's so nice. Oh, that looks so good. I love how that worked out with the, the blank area. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like it dry and scratchy like that too. I like that you, you kept it that way. Thank you for, for sharing. Was that it? Do we have anybody else that wanted to share? Oh, yes. Very nice. Those are so strong. I like how you put the little stars in there with the, the gel pens. I should do that on that one too, since the sky's a little darker. Okay. Um, well, I didn't get a chance to dig out my example from the, the premium classes that are coming up, but those are all on the Michaels website, those images. So um, just, you know, go to where you found 
uh, the the class listing for tonight, and uh, you should see the examples that I I didn't have right in front of me, but for the the cloud sketching class in pen and ink, and then uh, the premium class that I was talking about, the three part class on drawing the the models face, our lovely model Sion that we've been drawing in the, that figure drawing series. Okay, well, hopefully I will see a lot of you in the premium classes that are coming up. The way I scheduled them kind of back to back, we won't have another free class until um, halfway through January now. So um, happy holidays, and hopefully I'll see you in one of those premium classes in the interim. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good night.